This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Yo. Oh my gosh, you all right? Yeah, I couldn't press the recording now, got it button. Oh, got it. No pun intended. We are Christopher List today. Yes, he is in the ether somewhere. He's probably, hopefully, almost to my house. I would not rule out him actually like joining us before it's over, but. Mm. I feel like Chris is not a fast driver. That's mm. my impression of him. That's interesting because he does have one of those like minis that are like, I don't know how to describe it. Like from the Italian job? It's not from the Italian job, but what do they call like the John Cooper? They're the decked out one. Mm. I think he has one of those. I'm going to sound like a real idiot if he doesn't, but. Well, no one will ever know if he doesn't. That's true. But no, I guess Chris is like an average driver. Maybe Chris just likes the option to go fast. Ah, uh, okay. Like Ricky Bobby. Yeah, I want to go fast. Yeah, I uh, understand the desire and need to go fast. You have a home? I have a home. Proud. That's where my heart is. Oh, my sweet God. Yeah, it's inside my chest. <laughs> this is boring me. Let's move on. So... We have special guests today. We have Colleen and Aaron from Hammerstone. And I feel like there's a lot of things both of you like together and individually are involved in. So I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and I'm going to start with Colleen. All right. Well, I'm super pumped to be here to chat with you guys today. My name is Colleen. As you said, I am a Rails developer and consultant, and I have two products. I have simplefileupload.com, which is predominantly a Heroku add-on, and then co-founder of hammerstone.dev, which is the visual query builder, which is pretty awesome. Fantastic. And Aaron, how about you, my friend? Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Aaron, and like Colleen said, we're co-founders at Hammerstone. I also have a full-time job at a little company called Tuple that you guys might have heard of. So yeah, I am a Laravel developer. And so I'm excited to be here and talk about Rails and Laravel. But yeah, we're working together. Colleen and I are working together on a query builder for both ecosystems. And yeah, just excited to be here, talk databases, query builders, whatever you guys want to talk about. Tuple awesome. is that like array thing in Python, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Screen oh, right thing. It's something collection-y. I like it. It's a numeral. So let's see here. Where do we start? So we were just at RailsConf together. I'm treading here because I don't want to bring up any bad vibes. Bring it up. But y'all had a workshop around like advanced active record. And I know there are some Wi-Fi troubles, but let's maybe chat about what that workshop was about and like some of the things you're covering in it. Yeah. So the purpose of the workshop was actually to kind of introduce Rails developers to ARAL, which sits between Active Record and your database. And it's really what powers Active Record. So kind of what happened, it's kind of a really interesting genesis of how this all came out. Aaron had originally built the query builder in Laravel, which is PHP. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> PHP. You should know what? that by now. I do. The one true I framework. You, I wanted to know too. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and the constructs of the language are just very different than the constructs of the way we write Ruby. And so we tried very hard to keep basically the architecture of how this thing works the same. I kept bumping up against these edges with Active Record. It just wasn't powerful enough to build out SQL fragments the way I needed them. But I didn't want to actually use SQL strings because one of the things about the Query Builder that's so great is you can use it for whatever database. So that is how I got introduced to Arel and just started like really getting into it. And it's a really cool API. That's cool. We've talked like a hundred times about this, but it finally just clicked with me why you wouldn't want to use strings for that because you're supporting multiple databases. The thing I'm usually locked into is like, we just use Postgres at work. So like, I just always use Postgres. I don't even consider that other databases exist. So maybe for those listening who aren't super familiar with ARL, would you mind maybe just kind of giving a high level overview of like, we know it sits in between like active record and the database. What are some of the things that it gives us? So ARAL is an abstract syntax tree. And 
from a very high level, what that means is it builds out these nodes and then it puts the nodes together to form your SQL. So you always start with like your ARL table, which is going to be your model back table. But what is so interesting about it is you get this incredible granularity with SQL. So if you think of active record, if you do contact where name equals name Colleen, you're going to get select contact where name is Colleen. But there's no way in active record to actually break that into two pieces. So you can't separate the select statement from what you are trying to select, which means you don't really have as much control over the keys. And so what we were finding since we were building up these queries, ARL gives you the power to just get that little SQL query fragment. And then as you are building up, so our query builder, a little bit of a step aside here, but our query builder is really powerful because it can walk through your models, like all of your attributes and nested models. So we have this like recursive situation where we basically put these nodes together. And because we're able to separate the full, like kind of what you get from active record from just a SQL fragment, we're able to control how you build those nodes when you come out of the recursion. Cool. So like we have ARL and active record for the Laravel side of that. Are you having to rely on any kind of external libraries or does what Laravel give you handle everything you need? Fortunately, it handles everything we need, but it is in a little bit different way. So we don't have the concept of ARL. We don't have an abstract syntax tree that drives our M, which is called Eloquent. But there are two levels in Laravel as well. So there's the Eloquent ORM builder. And then underneath that, there's a base like database query builder. And so we have two different levels as well. But in Laravel, what we're finding is... So like Colleen is building up nodes and kind of passing the nodes around. What I'm doing is I'm just basically passing the query builder object around. So I'm passing a reference to the query as it is built in the lifecycle of the query builder, if that makes sense. So if a user says, I want people named Aaron that live in Texas and are over the age of 30, we go through that row by row by row and we bind the user's input in. And in Laravel, I'm passing the bound query object around and binding new stuff into it as we go. So I'm not building nodes. I'm just building on to a query object. I'm trying to, with my very limited knowledge, figure out which one is easier to work with. If there is one between the two. This is such an interesting question. And I think, Aaron, the big difference we found is in Laravel, the where statement takes a closure or something like that. The where statement can take a closure. So instead of saying, you know, where name equals Aaron, you can pass in a closure or a callback in some languages and you can do some more complicated stuff inside the callback. So our eloquent builder, our active record implementation is extremely powerful and flexible in that you can basically pass closures around anywhere you want. And so we use that to kind of do some of the more low level stuff. So instead of saying name equals Aaron, we actually pass in a closure that's bound with the user's input to be executed later. So we have a little bit more flexibility, I think, than Colleen was finding with active record. What I hear is what I just wanted to be affirmed, and that is Laravel has everything, but we can save that for another podcast. I'm having a uh, life crisis now that you've now that you've explained this. So both of these query builders for their perspective frameworks, where kind of are y'all in the process of launching each side? So for Rails, we're actually already doing a pre-sale, and we've actually sold a couple licenses to people that strongly feel this pain. And we're going to start integrating in customer apps in a couple of weeks. So we're there, like we're done. All right. It's really exciting. Yeah, it's super cool. On the Laravel side, we have some people using it in their apps already. So we've been in this spot for a long time. So what we offer is a backend component, which in our world is called like a composer package. And you also I believe a gem. And then we have front end packages that speak the exact same data transfer language. 
So we have a React front end, we have a Vue 2 and a Vue 3 front end, and we have a Hotwire front end. And we've been in this world for a while where the front ends are not configurable enough to match people's apps. And so they would get it installed and be like, hey, it works great. It doesn't look anything like my app. It's like, well, you have to eject all of the components and recreate it all yourself. It's like, that's never going to work. And so our very first sale on the Laravel side ran into that. And so we've been working pretty hard to make it customizable on the front end. And just this week, actually just yesterday, I had a call with him and showed him the new front end. And he was like, this is perfect. And I saw him tweet today that he was shipping it to production already. So we have several people who have bought one of our plugins that works in an admin interface. And he's the first one that bought and is using the full on Laravel view to totally customizable thing. So we're shipping and it feels so much better now to have that kind of out the door and into production. Did you use like CSS variables to make it customizable or did you kind of go with a more manual approach? That is a good question. So the problem is we have this giant nested recursive generative UI. So on the back end, when you say name equals Aaron, you're telling the front end, put a text field there. And when you're saying framework is Rails or Laravel, you're telling the front end, put a drop down there. And so we kind of have to control the whole thing. And so we end up with this massive set of nested components. So the question is, how do we let people customize that without ejecting? The first thing that we tried to do was just give everything class names and it was kind of janky. What we do now is, because it is all full on front end frameworks, is we wrap everything in a renderless component. So all of our individual components are wrapped in renderless components so that now in the life cycle, we're looking up as a renderless component is being rendered. We're looking up in a theme object, what classes they want to use for it. If they want to swap out the actual view or react component, we let them do that. And we give them a couple other hooks that they can like use to customize it. And so we now have this concept of a theme object and then all of our libraries, Vue 2, 3, and React, all are inspecting this theme object as they're rendering. I just am always interested in how people are kind of shipping these like customizable things because I have to customize something. <laughs> if you give me something, I'm going to customize it. So I'm always just curious how like developers are building up these systems where customizability is like forefront. And so... That's cool. That's really interesting. Are y'all able to share the front end libraries between both the Rails and Laravel one, or are they actually shipping separately? The answer is yes, but we have Hotwire Turbo, Vue, and React. So we should be able to use all of those front ends in Rails. That's and awesome. then on the Laravel side, we're obviously not using Hotwire, but yeah, the V2, <laughs> V3, and React all actually live in the same monorepo. And we've been working with some incredible contractors who have been helping us build that out. And those libraries actually share some type definitions, which is over my head, but they all work not only together with each other, like Vue 2, Vue 3, and React all kind of share a core, but they all speak the same language and Laravel and Rails emit the same JSON that the front ends are expecting and they talk back and forth the same way. So yeah. Cool. Yeah, I feel like that would be a tricky thing to get started with, but something that could pay like huge dividends as you continue to build upon it. Mm -hmm. For the Rails side, are you mounting a Rails engine to access the Query Builder? How does one access it once it's in the app? So right now it's an NPM package and a Ruby gem, and then, then it's there. Okay. Do you have to like mount it or anything to access the Query Builder or how does all that work on the Rails side? No, no. Okay. I mean, you have to, there's, so what it does is we keep the state on the front end. If you're using Hotwire Turbo, which is a little different than we had to make some customizations to get it to work with Hotwire Turbo. So it's a little different than the other front ends, but we managed to stay mostly on the front end. So we just publish like the filter is saved, the filter is unstable, the filter is stable. So then you as the developer, you integrate it you can do whatever you want once you have the filter. So you just render it as a turbo frame. It's just render the turbo frame. So that's how you physically are able to see it by rendering the turbo. 
And then you just listen for the events in your stimulus controllers. And it may be helpful to explain like what we ship to the end developer. So I think on both Colleen and my side, what the end developer, so like if y'all were integrating Refine into your app, what you would end up with is a base class. You would end up with an abstract class that we wrote that you would extend. So our class is just called filter or whatever. And then you would write user filter, product filter, company filter. And in those filters, you would tell us like, what's the starting point? And usually it's just like the user table or the contact table, but you can add scoping if you want, whatever. So you tell us what the starting point is. And then you tell us which attributes should we expose to your end users? So you say, well, first name, last name, number of projects, referral source, that kind of thing. And then you've extended our base class with your class, implemented those few methods, and then all the data that goes out to the front end, our front end will pick up on it and build that interface for them. That makes sense. Cool. Thank you for explaining that. So it may be a little early to ask this question, but I am also curious what it's like trying to like maintain feature parity between the two. Has that been a problem yet? Or are we still kind of like early on? We haven't experienced that as much. That's a good question. I think what's interesting is we have myself, we have Aaron, we have three contractors. So we have a lot of people kind of working on this. And I do think it's something we're trying to be really diligent about because right now I'm building it out for a big client as a consulting project. So I'm adding features really quickly. And so making sure like everyone, both packages are up to date. It's definitely an interesting challenge. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to like be able to develop all of these things together. But there is a little bit of coordination complexity, especially from my point of view, especially between the back ends and front ends. So then you start thinking about the different versionings, right? So you have a Laravel version, a Rails version, and a front end version, and they all have to always speak the same language. So that data transfer object that we're sending back and forth always has to work. And you have to start thinking about backwards compatibility and stuff like that. So feature parity between Colleen and I is not so bad. I think feature parity between the front ends and the back ends has been a little bit harder. And it's possible to do graceful upgrades where like some things work on the back end that don't yet work on the front end. It's just, you can't go the other way around. Everything that used to work on the front end has to continue to work on the back end because you don't know what version of the library that people are using on the front end. And so that's something that I'm thinking a lot about is like versioning. How do, do we do the back ends and the front ends major version together? So do we make a commitment to our people that version one of Laravel is always going to work with version one of Vue? And if we do a major of Laravel, we have to do a major of all the front ends and we should definitely do a major of Rails at the same time. So I don't know. It's a lot of coordination complexity. Some of it has been fun so far. I think some of it will be a nightmare, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah, that's interesting considering like... Does a new version of Laravel come out and change something structurally important to it? Do you then have to release a new major version and Rails is on a different schedule? That is, that does sound fun and a nightmare, like all in one. So I'm excited to hear how that works. Just so you know, I want them all the same version. <laughs> that would be what I yeah. want. Well, that would make more sense to me because especially in Rails, I'm used to upgrading a gem and then also if it has a corresponding NPM package, they're usually the same version. If they're not the same version, this happened a lot with the Webpacker days where people would upgrade the gem and they're like, I don't understand, it's not working. And that's because they forgot to upgrade the NPM package to the same version. To me, and I feel like to a lot of other people who I've discussed this with, it's a lot more clear when they both just need to be the same version. And so there's no question of like, oh, well, the gem got upgraded, but the NPM version is the same. When is that going to get upgraded? Yeah, that's great feedback. So basically you're saying if I upgraded the gem, even if the NPM package didn't change, I should still version it. So they're exactly the same. If it's 1.1, yes. it should be one. Yes, that's good. Does that apply to majors or minors as well? So if your Ruby gem say is on 2.1 and your React NPM is on 2.0, does that make you nervous or are you fine with a major 
being the same and a minor being different? I think I would be fine with it, but it would make more sense to me if they were the same in my brain. Because it's just like, it feels like less the juggle. Yeah, stimulus reflex does it. And it makes it easy because they've had some not major, but heavy changes, even like 3.1 to 3.2. And it's it's nice just knowing like, I'm just going to upgrade both and I don't have to question if there's a difference in the two. Right. They do as well is when you install the gym, like with bundle install, it actually spits out a message. Make sure you've upgraded to, or you have the matching version NPM. Yeah. That's good. It's a nice little touch. I guess yeah. if you didn't want to have them the same version, that like after install message could be the place where like, okay, just so you know, like this gem version is compatible with this NPM version and up. Smart. We could totally do that as well. Yeah, this is really yeah, helpful. Thanks for saying that's that. That's good feedback. Cool. I'll send you guys a bill. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to take even another step backwards. So how did we end up in a place where you're both working on a product for two different frameworks. I would be curious kind of just hear the beginnings of Refine. And how y'all met. How did this start? Yeah, so the beginnings of Refine started at an old day job that I had. And I got it specifically excluded from my employment agreement because I thought this is something I think I could do for a long, long time. And so... It started because I was at this company and people kept asking for more and more power when filtering the data. So it was a property tax company and they would be like, hey, can you show us all of our clients that are in Dallas County and the assessed value is under 300,000 and our fee rate is 40%. And I'd be like, I mean, yeah, I got to build a new piece of UI every time you come and ask me for that, or I have to run it manually myself. And I didn't want to run these things all the time. And so I kept adding more and more form fields and they kept asking for more, you know, the more you give them, the more they want. And so finally I was like, I'm just going to bite the bullet and make a flexible query builder. And so that's kind of where it started. And then I extracted it, rewrote the whole thing multiple times now, actually. And now we have this general query builder that can be used for basically any purposes with a much nicer developer interface than the one that I originally wrote. And so I was working on this and actually a friend of Colleen and my, our our friend Sean started working on it with us. And so he and I were working on it for a while and we got interest from a big client in the Ruby world. So a friend of ours knew that Sean and I were working on this and came to us and said, Hey, I met this client. They really need a query builder can y'all do it for them? And I was like, man, this thing is written in Laravel and you're talking about a Rails client. It's like, yeah, 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 I know. They'll pay you to do it and then you get to keep the IP. So what if you just came over and kind of ported it from Laravel to Rails? And Sean and I were like, I mean, I guess so. Like we wanted to end up with two versions. So why not do it on someone else's dime? So we needed to find a contractor and Colleen was the contractor. And we had met, I think, a few years before at a little bootstrap retreat conference kind of thing. And so we pulled Colleen in and worked with her for about a year. And I'll let her tell the story. But I think the problem just deeply embedded itself in Colleen's brain. And she learned to love this recursive generative madness and... So since then, Sean got this amazing job that he loves and has decided to step back. And so it's me and Colleen and she's full on co-founder. She's switched from, she still works at that big client, but she and I are the two co-founders now. And that's kind of the origin story. Did I miss anything, Colleen? That's that's pretty good. I think some of the kind of funny points here is I think when they first hired me as I was originally just as a normal consultant, we thought this was not going to be a big deal. Like, we're like, oh, porting from Laravel to Rails? How hard can that be? It was, in fact, a big deal. (laughs) So I think it was really fun and kind of crazy. And some of the stuff, like this whole thing we were talking about earlier with this accepting a callback and these where clauses, that caused me a lot of stress. And the problem just kept getting more and more interesting and more and more complicated. And dealing with big data and like, how do we solve these issues And it was just great fun. And I was really into it. And also funny, like I didn't know Aaron. I had met you once for like 10 minutes, kind of like high five. 
nice to meet you. <laughs> so it was kind of a big step to go from consulting for someone you don't know to founding a company with them. But I think we got to know each other better while we were working together while I was building out the product. And it was just so much fun. Like what more can you ask for in life than to build something that's fun with people you enjoy? I think launching a product like this with one, two, three, four, five different repos is a whole thing. <laughs> Maybe yeah, wasn't... Don't do it. Don't do the it. Most, <laughs> yeah, don't do it. So it certainly has complicated the situation having two back ends and three front ends, but we're having a good time. The first time that Colleen DM'd me one morning and she said, hey, so I was thinking about Query Builder last night while I was walking. And I was like, yeah, you were. We got you. I know you were thinking about it. It's fun, isn't it? She's like, yeah, I just can't. Like, I just can't stop thinking about this one problem. So Welcome. True. So good to have you. <laughs> that rules. I think that's a great story. And I think it's cool because I've got the chance to hang out with both of you and like, it's always fun. So I think it's cool that you get to experience that like working together. I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Honey Badger. They are not only my favorite error and uptime monitoring service, but they've also added several awesome new features. One of those being the public status pages. So it makes perfect sense that your error and uptime monitoring tool can have a public status page for you to communicate any downtime outages with your customers. So whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, Honey Badger is there for you to help communicate any downtime or outages with your customers. Plus, they've also added SSL certificate monitoring. So like many of us use these days, Let's Encrypt certificates expire every 90 days. And if for some reason you're a week away from expiring an SSL certificate, they can let you know ahead of time so that you can take care of it without any outages for your customers. Plus, managing the errors and things inside of Honey Badger has gotten even easier with Honey Badger Actions, which you can use to automatically assign errors to yourself or another team member, add tags to different error classes, and more. And they also have batch actions, which you can use on the search results to help manage your backlog of work to do. So Honey Badger is the place to check out for error and uptime monitoring, and it's only getting better. So Check them out at honeybadger.io. I do want to shift gears a little bit and actually talk about some products you both have separately, if that would be cool. First, with uh, Simple File Upload. So you were saying it's a predominantly kind of used with Heroku, but how long have you been working on Simple File Upload? Kind of what does it do? Where did it come from? Would love to hear that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I've had Simple File Upload, I think for a little over a year. Okay. I've been selling it for a little over a year. I've been working on it a lot longer than that. <laughs> I'm sure everyone who has a side project appreciates how that goes. You're like, oh, I have this idea. I'm going to work on it a little bit. Oh, da, da. So I've been selling it for about a year. It's in the Heroku marketplace. It is also available outside the Heroku marketplace. And I mean, it's literally that. It's like a file uploader that you can add to your site just by adding one line of JavaScript and the class simple file upload to a hidden input. Cool. It's like so it's deal. not real specific then. It is actually anything yeah, at the front end. Anything. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, amazing. It's a whole different product. Yeah, that's it. That's cool. I will say that is a pain point for me or always has been is... UI for uploading. The browser somehow in 2022 still functions like trash when it comes to file uploads. And I feel like I'm reinventing the wheel every time. And so I think that is a cool opportunity to build something for. Yeah. And How I think that's kind of why I built it because I was independent and it was like company after company after company needed file uploading. And every time it was just such a pain. <laughs> Like, it's just, I really think like the UI struggles with that. Whew. Yeah. Never have again. Now I can just drop the widget in. I'm good. Yes. I built my 200th image uploader a couple of years ago and I was really proud of it. And I told myself I'm never going to do this again. And so now I just try to avoid using images at all costs. <laughs> There's um, a solution. Yeah. I'm, just avoid the problem. Yeah. I'm really good at that. We built one in-house at Podia that's like React-based and 
it's really good for what we need, but there's just, there's so many edge cases too, with all that, like I'm multiple files, single files. So I think that's, I think it's really cool. How has adoption been over the past year? So I have noticed there is a direct correlation to how much I actually market it and how many people actually sign up. So when I first launched it, like it, it shot up really quickly. And I think one of the huge benefits, so the service is not just like the uploader, it uploads. So basically you drop a file, it uploads its direct upload to S3 and it returns to you the URL and it can resize on demand. And I have client side image resizing. So in the beginning, like it was phenomenal. It shot up really quickly. And then as I got more and more into Hammerstone, I just didn't have the time. Like I just, two side projects and a full-time job. No, <laughs> it was not. Yeah, um, that's so overwhelming. Yeah, I didn't have time for it. So it's kind of sat for about six months, pretty stagnant, but I just hired someone to help me with marketing. So I'm pretty excited about that. So we'll see. Cool. Yeah. Is it the head of marketing at Tuple. <laughs> it's not, but um, it's not. I know him. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. I'm very much impressed that you've not only shipped one product, but two products on the side. So all the admiration and applause for me. And Aaron, I think you have more than the one I'm about to talk about, but I want to talk about Torchlight because both Andrew and I have used it, swear by it, think it is a bright spot in a very dark <laughs> world of text highlighting. So we've talked about on the podcast before, but maybe for those who haven't heard that episode, would you maybe mind just kind of same thing? What does Torchlight do? Kind of how you've been working on it? Where did you get the idea? All that good stuff. Yeah, sure. So Torchlight is a syntax highlighter. I mean, that's the basis of it, but it's a little bit different because it is not an in-client syntax highlighter. So it doesn't run in your browser. And that's a little bit weird because all the other ones do. So Highlight JS, Prism, I think those are the two biggest ones. Those run in the browser and that's usually pretty great. You're kind of limited there because all the stuff you would have to ship to the browser and the power of the browser to actually do proper getting the code into an AST they kind of just do regex matching, which, you know, most of the time works great. What Torchlight does is it's a syntax highlighter that lives at a central service. And then I have clients that call out to that API. So it's an API that does syntax highlighting. And so I've got a couple different types of Laravel clients. I've got a standalone CLI. I've got some JavaScript stuff. And the power that you can get when you're actually running on a server or in node, it runs on Vercel, so it's serverless, but it's still in node. The power that you can get is so much more than when you're in a browser. And so what I'm able to do, the VS Code syntax highlighting stuff is all open source. And so there are some cool packages that add a little bit of scaffolding around that. One of them is called Shiki. And Shiki is a node only syntax highlighter. You can get it in the browser, but it's massive and it's WASM and whatever. So what I did is I took Shiki and added even more around it and put it at an API. And now, depending on the client you use, the client will gather up the code blocks on your site or on the page that's being loaded, send it off to the API, and it will send back highlighted code blocks. And so what that means is every single language that VS Code supports, I can also support with Torchlight. And it's just a massive number. And so I'm kind of sitting on top of this like hugely funded, massively maintained ecosystem. And so when somebody's like, hey, I want this super obscure language. Great. Can you find me the VS Code plugin that lets that work in VS Code? And then I can add that language grammar on the server and then we're ready to go with highlighting. And so once I got that, like, I feel like step one was get the highlighting just right because all these new syntax, all these new language features were coming out in PHP 8 and all of the highlighters were just missing them completely. So you're trying to do these like super cool blog posts, these sexy documentation sites and your code highlighting just looks like crap. It's like half of it is bright green and you're like, 
this is totally wrong and it's incredibly frustrating. And does it matter? Probably not, but it super matters. And so I feel like step one was get the highlighting right. Just, I want it to look like VS Code. If it works in VS Code, it should work on my website. And then I realized, wait, this is actually parsing stuff down into tokens that I can inspect along the way. So it's not just, this is a string that we think is a function. I know exactly what kind of language token this is for every different language that I'm highlighting. And so the next thing I did was I thought, I really want to be able to control, like the reason that I'm using syntax highlighting is because I'm writing a blog post, I'm writing documentation. And each of those has different context. And so if I have a code block and I'm trying to draw attention to a specific line, but still show surrounding context, I want to highlight that line or I want to blur the lines behind it. And the solution for every other syntax highlighter that does this is they put some sort of inscrutable characters at the very top. They'll put one comma three comma five and that's highlight lines one, three, and five, but it never says that. And you don't know that. And then the other problem is that mucks up your editing, right? Because if you're writing, let's say you're writing Ruby and the syntax that you use to highlight the lines is not Ruby. Now your code block is all weird. So what I figured out is I can put annotations inside of actual code comments. So if you're writing Ruby, you put a Ruby comment in and you say, highlight this line. If you're writing PHP, you put a proper PHP comment in that says highlight this line or this line was deleted and this line was added. So put a red background and a green background. And so now I've got all these different annotations to help you communicate your ideas when you're writing either documentation or blog posts, but it's valid syntax. Like it's actual Ruby code. It's actual PHP code. And so I'm parsing out all these comments and taking apart annotations and highlighting it and sending it back so that you can communicate your ideas better, but you don't have to like, it's not a pain to get there. You're not targeting things in a really obscure and painful way. Is as absurd as this sounds, even just having syntax highlighting that doesn't like flash when my blog posts load is, I don't know, it just means a lot to me. I think it's a really fantastic idea. It also, I haven't really thought about why I don't really like the other ones besides like what I just mentioned. But yeah, if everything is regex, okay, PHP has a new version. Somebody's got to go update that regex. If you never update that package, you will never get that new version. Bingo. It's a lot of moving parts. What kind of response have you gotten from releasing this product? Yeah, so it's been incredibly positive. I built this because I was super annoyed and petty and thought this should look better. I'm going to make it look better. And then I kind of released it as a thing and people were like, yeah, I really want to use this. And that was exciting. And it also blew my mind. It's used on Laravel.com, which is probably the biggest site. It's used on Fathom Analytics website, Laravel News. And just dozens of different places that I never would have expected. It's been incredible. As of now, it is a kind of hybrid free paid thing. If you're a company, you should pay for it. And if you're just an individual, it's totally free. That is going to go away. It's all going to be free. And I'm going to basically try to blitz the market. I feel like And I think every developer feels this way. I feel like I have a technologically superior product to whatever else is out there. And I don't know that I'm gaining much by charging, I don't know, $14 a month to businesses. And if you want to, as an individual, you can pay $5 a month. Who is that helping? Not me. (laughs) I mean, I'm never going to make it on $14 a month. What I could make it on is owning the entire syntax highlighting mindshare and ecosystem and then doing something interesting with that. So that's the plan. I've gotten a company to redesign the site. I'm working on moving all of the rendering actually to fly.io because Vercel is good. If I'm going to make it free and also introduce an option to where you can have a client side highlighting, it still hits the API, but it's going to be done from the client side in case you can't hook into your static site generator, whatever. I need to have presence all over the world so that 
that flash that you mentioned, if somebody does use the client side is 15 milliseconds and not a hundred because that's not viable. So yeah, we have a lot of big plans for that. It's going to be totally free available from the client side, but none of the server side stuff will go away. Cause I think for static sites and for people that want to hook in to like Laravel middleware, Ruby middleware, that kind of thing. I think that's more valuable and then hopefully take over the world. I mean, that's the plan. We'll see if it works, but that's the plan. I think that's not too ambitious. That's good. So I have no experience with serverless. You're talking about like serverless functions and I'm like, yeah, I know that's a thing that exists. What I'm interested in is if you make the service free, is it very costly to use serverless functions in that type of environment? What's that like? Yeah, serverless is great. Serverless has drawbacks, of course. So serverless charges for compute, which is fine. But in this situation where the real hangup is if I allow it from the front end, which I'm going to, I can't take advantage of your server-side caching. So all of our clients that I have save a cache on inside your app so that every time a page loads, you're not hitting the API. You're only hitting the API for stuff that's stale. On the client side, I can't do that because every request is going to be coming from a different browser. So now I'm suddenly opening myself up to two orders of magnitude, different scale. Once you start doing that kind of scale on something like Vercel, the trade-off really becomes ease of use and cost, right? Vercel could handle it without breaking a sweat. I wouldn't even make a ripple in their pond. They're fine. But the issue then becomes, how much do I want to pay for that? And so looking at something like Fly, and Fly is globally distributed servers. They own their own hardware, so it doesn't sit on top of AWS or anything that has a private network all between it. So it's this really weird combo of serverless and server full. But putting it on Fly, I could run servers in Australia, three parts of the US, the UK, South America. I could do all of that for, I don't know, $100 a month or something like that. And they're going to route all the requests to the most efficient server. That to me is kind of best of both worlds. I think serverless is fantastic for ease of use. What you gain for ease of use with serverless, you sacrifice in billing predictability. And I don't have unlimited money, (laughs) surprise. And so I want a little more billing predictability than I want ease of use. And Fly kind of splits the difference because it is predictable billing, but it's also pretty easy to use. I've seen Fly mentioned a lot. Uh, I follow a lot of people in the Elixir world, and I know that Fly has made like a pretty big push. Like I'm pretty sure it's Chris McCord, creator of Phoenix works there now. So I'm definitely familiar with Fly and I've never tried it out. But even this conversation, I have no side projects that need to be available at that scale, but I still am like, oh, I want to try out Fly. We have an ad to get put on it. <laughs> oh, Lord. We could we could put Podia on it. I think Kitsy Dodds said that his personal site runs on Fly, not for the global availability, just for the ease of deployment and the ease of use. And so one of their hooks is global deployment across actual servers. Another one of their hooks is actually just really easy to use. It's kind of like a new Heroku with targeting maybe one step down in the abstraction chain, maybe. That makes sense. Heroku, obviously a big topic of conversation with developers recently. So this is timely chatter. I had one more question I want to cover. I guess this one really is more for Aaron. I'm curious you're a Laravel developer, but you came to RailsConf. I mean, you actually gave a workshop at RailsConf. You've been hanging out with us Rails developers recently. I'm curious just kind of what your experience has been like coming kind of from the outside world into this. Yeah, just general thoughts and experience. Universally positive. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally an outsider to y'all's community. I don't feel quite so much like that anymore now that I've been to RailsConf and met y'all in person. But yeah, I feel like I have a lot of friends on the Rails side. Obviously, Colleen, Andrew Culver, and several of the people that I've known for a long time have been Rails developers. And then I don't know what happened. Maybe it was Torchlight or something, but I feel like I started to kind of get out of just the Laravel world on Twitter. 
and started to meet some more like Jason, you and I had a call about Torchlight a long time ago. And I think that's kind of what started. I started to be introduced to these other people on Twitter. And so like I would see you talking to somebody and I would interject myself or like some tweets or respond to something. And everyone has just been so friendly. When I found that at RailsConf as well, everyone was just extremely kind and pleasant and friendly. I was definitely the fish out of water there, but everyone made me feel super welcome. And it, it would have been fine if people like kind of made fun of me for being there as like a Laravel developer. That would have been a good bit. I would have gotten the joke and it would have been funny, but everyone was super nice. You're like, hey, we're super glad you're here. I want to do Laravel. And it's like, oh, wow. Like people know that I'm a Laravel person because they would say stuff like that, but they're not ribbing me for showing up. So it's been universally positive. I'm just thrilled to be a part of it and have friends across communities. And y'all have been super welcoming. So way to go, Ruby. Way to go, Rails, I guess. Glad to hear that. Colleen, was he making snide comments about things that Laravel could do the whole time? That's what I really want to know. (laughs) No, he wasn't. <laughs> he was well okay. behaved. <laughs> People aren't making fun of you. I'm not making fun of you because I'm jealous. So that's why I have no side remarks. I wouldn't make fun of you to your face. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a true statement. That is of some comfort, I guess. <laughs> no, I think it's anytime that you have someone of a different background, especially like for me and I think as Jason as well. It's not like, oh, this guy does something different. What a loser. It's always, what are they doing that I can learn from and take inspiration from and introduce into my community or into the work that I'm doing? So I think it was like, oh, Aaron's here. That's super cool that if I had a Laravel question, I could have asked you. It's not like, oh, this guy, he doesn't understand. We're over here writing enlightened Ruby. This guy is writing PHP. What the hell, you know? So I like, what can I learn from this guy? I will say what you just said there is not, at least online, is not the standard refrain. Anytime you're online and you see somebody talking about PHP, a bunch of people are going to chime in and say, well, I can't believe... Do people still use PHP? Oh, wow. I guess, what a loser. They're still using PHP over at that company. And so there is a little bit of that, of we tool around online and everybody's like, PHP, give me a break. Call me when you pick up something real. And we see that a lot online, but... I've never seen that from any of the Ruby people that I know. And I didn't get that impression at all in person. So it's just this anonymized like PHP sucks that's out there. And so to not have ever been derided for using PHP by any of y'all, this is a nice place to hang. I like this place. I also guarantee you that all those people chirping online wouldn't almost the majority would never have said say it to your face. If you're like, ah, I'm a PHP developer, they're not going to be like, oh, and start going off in your face (laughs) because why would they? We live in a society. I mean, some of them will for sure, but I don't know. I think it's just when you're anonymous, you feel like, oh, well, I can be a dick, (laughs) but we're glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Very much so. And I lied. Colleen, I actually have one more thing I want to talk about if we have time. Sure. You are a speaker at the SAS Rails Conference. Andrew Culver announced this past week. And I am just kind of curious if you have some ideas about what you're wanting to talk about at the conference and just kind of your overall excitement for the conference. I am so excited for this conference. So I live in San Diego. So on Thursday, I actually took the train up to LA, which who knew you could do that? Apparently you can do that. And checked out the venue and checked out LA with Andrew and just had the best time. The hotel, the venue is going to be amazing. The whole experience is going to be top notch. And yeah, so I've just started thinking about what I want to speak on. And the concept of the conference is this intersection between rails and business. So I am probably going to kind of lean into that and talk about Hammerstone stuff specifically because it's such a good intersection of these two things. Yeah, I'm super pumped. We're going to have so much fun, Jason. I'm so happy you're speaking too. I was really honored. I was like taken aback that Andrew would ask me to speak. So we met last Friday and like ripped on what I would talk about. And we landed on, I'll be talking about the Rails Renaissance, which is... Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Andrew kind of dropped that phrase and I was like, I feel like I could do that because 
like Aaron and I had a call one time, like when we were talking about Torchlight, I think we spent the first half hour, I talked about like all the things I wish Rails did that Laravel does, but then also like now I, I see a lot of things that Rails is doing well. So there's a lot for me to talk about to choose from. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. Yeah, I think I want my focus to be like inspirational in terms of like you have new people who want to build businesses. What is the best way to get there? How do you get there as quickly as possible? And I just think Rails provides so much that people who are like, oh, we all know the refrain, like people aren't using Rails or everything is JavaScript, like they're really missing out on an opportunity. You're right. There's a lot of chatter online on the hacker news (laughs) where I see people saying things like, I've been building SaaS apps in Node and I built a Rails app the other day. And I just forgot how quick it is or how simple it is. And I don't know that. That warms my heart a little bit. It's like the feeling people get watching This Is Us. I get reading those comments on Hacker News. It'll be exciting. I'm excited. I'll be there. Are you? I won't be speaking, but I'll be there. You're going to be there? Nice. I'll be there. Awesome. Front row. That's my spot. (laughs) Front row. (laughs) The topic of like inspiring people to build businesses is such a fantastic topic. I also think that is part of how Rails continues to stay relevant and evolve is people still building things on Rails. Like much like Laravel has so many people building SaaS apps and things. And it's very evident to me that like a lot of the community, like not only came from like how well thought out the framework is, but just it's really thrived because people are building real businesses and yeah. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful topic. Thanks. I'm just making it up as I sit here and talk to you, but it's not even like building a business. It's like building your life. If you think of how these things are connected, the work you do and how you make money, like it's building your life. It's like designing your life the way you want. And software, specifically Rails in this case, can like help you get there. I kid you not, I just got chills. (laughs) Same. Same. (laughs) All right. That's the topic then. I'm in. Yeah. And I feel like that is a like fantastic preview of, well, I guess it's hard to get tickets now, but I was just saying it's sold out. If you find them, good luck. Well, this has been a fun chat and I appreciate both of you taking the time to sit down and talk about this myriad of topics. I alluded to it earlier, but I know both of you are on podcasts. I think even multiple podcasts. So I want to give you both an opportunity just to maybe share some places people can find you online. Colleen, if you want to go first. Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter. Best way to find me at Leany Burger. And then Aaron and I have a podcast together. That is the Hammerstone Dev Podcast. And then I have another podcast called Software Social. Which is so good, by the way. Thanks. You can find me on Twitter at Aaron D. Francis. I don't know what a Leany Burger is, but you can find me at Aaron D. Francis on Twitter. And if you want to hear Colleen and I talk a bunch more, hammerstone.dev slash podcast. And then I have another podcast about frameworks. So it's about Rails and Laravel and Django and Phoenix. And you can find that at frameworkfriends.com. That's me and Andrew Culver. That's such a cool also podcast, so man. good. Oh, thanks. Well, again, thank you both for joining us. And Andrew, anything you want to throw into the ether before we burn this to the ground? Go build cool stuff, people.